one of my very good friends. This person was when all of this started, when I was just starting out with the videos, people would call me and they would ask questions all the time and you know, they, you know I'd answer and do the best I can. But this guy was the first one that he just, I don't know if it was a phone call or it was a message, answered a couple questions, he called me. I didn't, ask, I didn't tell him to call me, he just freaking called me. But after he called me, we had a little conversation. He said, Vince, I wanna go see you. And I said, okay, come on, let's go. He said, all right, I just wanna go see you, just shout at you for a day, just see what you do. I said, all right, I'll set up some appointments and we'll just, we'll just run around. So he came and I think, it was a hell of a day. We did initial inspection, I think we did an appraisal. You probably heard me fight with like three desk adjusters in the car on the phone, because that's sort of what happens. I think I might have settled the claim that day, so he brought me some good luck. And after that, we went out to dinner, had some drinks, had a great time. Next day, next day he even came over for some breakfast. And ever since then, you know, I consider him a friend, colleague, and what's funny is not just with Randolph, but with everyone else that I've been doing these courses for, that I'm, there, everybody's calling me and asking me questions. Everybody's taking these courses and they're doing all these things and they're supposedly learning from me. The funny part is, is that I learn more from everyone else than I think they learn from me. And Randolph is a guy that in just the year or two years that we've known each other now, I can say hands down, I learned more from this guy than he has learned from me. Because Randolph is the kind of person that all he wants to do is learn, 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 learn more, learn more, and learn more. And it's taken him to a point where he's been able to fast track, in my opinion, 13 years of experience like I've got, and he's done it in like just two or three years. So without further ado, but before I do that, I'm gonna bring you up, Randolph. I forgot to thank I forgot to thank our lovely sponsors. I'm so sorry. Matt and Shanna. Matt and Shanna, honestly, guys, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're just lawyers. Who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> they took the time to find the right venue, set up the food, set up all this stuff. This is the first time we have a meetup that is just not a crowded room full of people getting hammered. Hopefully, that'll happen after. <laughs> So honestly, uh, Matt Shanna, thank you so much for the sponsor for that. And now that brings me back to my man, Randolph Love. Come on in. They kept me going. Uh, it, you read in books all the time, it's about relationships. You, I mean, and it, it sounds good until you see, it looks like the only reason I'm still getting paid because the relationships I built when there was no money involved. And then when the money came, I didn't change. And then once the people who see 
that when the money comes in the mist and you don't change, that's when it really starts getting big. That's when you start having events like this, uh, which hopefully we continue to do. But here we go. Here is my, uh, my PowerPoint, first PowerPoint I ever made. Hope you like it. And it's about being a pragmatic adjuster. How to do more by doing less. I'm currently uh, reading the book now, and it, it makes so much sense because basically the way they break it down is when you have people, when you have the products and you have an experience, if people come up to you and say you're a contractor, that's just a commodity. There's other contractors out there that can do what you do. But if you are a home modification specialist, <laughs> it's, and then you provide type of experiences like that, it just changes the whole thing. So definitely, I've been doing this for over a decade in the industry. I started with sales at State Farm. Uh, I kept uh, selling, selling, sold for years. And then I became an independent adjuster. I was literally only an independent adjuster for maybe not even a year, and I was down working uh, managed claim models. I started with State Farm as an independent, because uh, once I switched from uh, sales, then I was down in Citizens making the most money I ever made in my life. It was a bad money if I made 15 grand, but I hated my job. I literally hated it. I didn't even know why I didn't want it. My dream when I left, I said, if I can be working in Miami, making 150 grand a year, I'm good for life. And then I realized the only reason I was make, working in Miami, making 150 grand, because that's all I asked for. So when I when I just got rid of it, then I came to this. So let me ask y'all, who, who's the public adjuster in here? Okay, can I ask you, what's the problem? What's the problem? Yeah, what's the problem? No problem, okay, shoot. As soon as you found that legitimate claim is getting taken care of ASAP, right? Anybody else, do any public adjusters here feel like there's currently a problem with the claim handling process? Can anybody give me one problem? Managed repair. Say what? Managed repair. Managed repair. The insurance company. The insurance company. <laughs> oh, so, so he, 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 went to the, he went to the symptom and he went to the cause, right? So the problem is sometimes people try to control a policy to where the ambiguity shouldn't allow them to do that, right? Uh, so me, I'm like this. Once I figured out what the problem was, I said, how can I look? I, I had a claim that was lasting for so long and I said, I wish that I could have just looked into the future and saw that this was gonna happen. I wish that I had uh, just the, the foresight to know. And then I realized majority of my claims were happening like this. So I do have the foresight. I was going off of the, uh, the model that you, you wait for the insurance carrier to open up coverage. They have up to 90 days. Who's, to us, it's, it, for me, all right, so I drove to uh, New Orleans for the first time. But prior to that, going to Pensacola was a, was, it was a chore. I, I, I swore I would never do it again. But then as soon as I drove to uh, uh, New Orleans, let's go, oh, let's go. I can do that backwards, right? So what happens, when you look at these things, when, when, you, when you go down that long road of dealing with a claim, just by yourself, before having to bring anyone in, that's not like some nine months, 12 months, you say, the next claim do the same thing? No, you gotta look at that information and adjust. So what I started doing was saying, hey, a small percentage of my claim, this might not work. But for a majority of the claims, if I'm looking at the stats, if I'm seeing that usually a carrier is gonna make me wait forever just to open the coverage, and then when I tell them, when I point out something obvious to them with third-party documentation, they just say no. And, I, and me being from that side, I know they don't even have the authority. And me being from that side, I know when they say, hold on, let me check something. They say, hey, y'all help me out. They don't know what's going on. Why am I building a relationship with somebody that don't know what's going on? Yeah, we're human beings. If I see, if I see a, a desk just out there, I, I might give them a token. But if I'm trying to handle a claim, there's no need for me to be arguing with that person who has relatively no authority forever. And I love independent adjustments. I love staff adjustments. It's just, why am I arguing? 
Why am I sending uh, War and Peace in an email? You shouldn't have to do that. So, and once again, when I say typical public adjuster, I just mean this is typically what I've seen that public adjusters do. And then I have what I call a pragmatic public adjuster. Uh, a typical public adjuster only submits a, a properly executed sworn proof of loss if the insurance carrier requests one. A typical public adjuster waits for the carrier to make a claim decision, and they have up to 90 days, then reacts by sending their estimate. A typical public adjuster argues for weeks or months with a desk adjuster who has relatively no authority because most people like to hear themselves be right, right? And they never CC the insured on any claims communication. This is what a pragmatic public adjuster does. Documents damages, gathers supporting documentation, writes estimate, has insured sign a tentative sworn proof of loss. And I say tentative, in that proof of loss, I'm letting them know that, hey, uh, things can happen, this could change. Uh, then submit all claim documentations to carrier within the first seven to 10 days. Anybody else do that? You look familiar, man. <laughs> And then I include, and when I do that, if the claim has already been started prior to me, what I'm doing is I'm submitting a mediation request and a CRN if applicable. Now I know a lot of people are scared of CRNs that aren't attorneys. So you do have attorneys such as Matt that and Shannon that hey, they, they, they can work something out with you if you just need a CRN to get things rolling, right? Uh, files complaints with the Department of Financial Services. If no acknowledgement or receipt in 14 days, our claim decision in 30 days. How many people knew that the carrier has up to 14 days to reply to you? How many people are sending, um, well, I need an update after three to seven days? If you already know this rule and we expect them to abide by the rules, why are we trying to force them? Let them, give them the rope. Because guess what, on day 15, now you have a legitimate reason to file a, a complaint. 30 days, a lot, of, a lot of insurance carriers aren't used to somebody submitting a sworn proof of loss off the gate. They might even not even see us there. You know, I, I try to make it as plain as day, but they might not even know, but guess what, on day 31, that's a complaint. Because what I'm doing is, I'm not saying that the Department of Financial Services is gonna be gonna do anything. They're probably not. But what it is, is it's helping out my attorney that I might have to use. I want them to have as much leverage as possible I wanted to be able to say, because uh, from what I under her understood, one of the main reasons that it takes a little longer for an attorney to get these claims turned around is because they're trying to establish a dispute. Guess what happens when you have a mediation that's unsuccessful? That sounds like a, a dispute to me. Guess what happens when you file a complaint when they take more than 14 days? That sounds like a dispute to me. Guess what happens when you file a complaint when they take more than 31 days? That sounds like a dispute. I, whoever watched Judge Judy, she said, Judge, I was scared for my life. She said, did you call the police? <laughs> you weren't that scared. Pragmatic. Because my PowerPoint needed some graphics, I went ahead and screenshotted this. Pragmatic, uh, dealing with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. Oh yeah, that, that PA that you love so much that you met, they talk so good. Theoretically, what they're saying is true. They, they, they close, they get a thousand a square on a, on a, on a no-tab roof. But practically, I think we all see what normally happens, right? Okay, so this is my claim process in a nutshell, right? Day one, insurer signs my agreement, and then I photo document. I try to get all of those measurements and documents done on day one. Now, as a public adjuster, I think you know they have a, a, a right of rescission, right? I'm not sending all of that stuff until after that decision is, 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 is already lapsed. And then that's when I okay, submit the documentation. But I know some people won't even do, won't even take pictures and do the, and do the measurements until that right to rescission has elapsed. Go ahead and knock it out now and just wait to send it after it laps. That's, that's, that's the pragmatic way to do it, right? 
uh, between day two and 14, I'm submitting my claim package, and including the sign of uh, sworn proof of loss, mediation request, and CRN. Once again, I know uh, CRNs are scary for some of y'all, but I did my research and I feel confident. I'm not gonna try to convince y'all to do otherwise. But all I can say is find an attorney that you like and try to work something out. Day 21 to 45, that's the mediation process. Uh, after I submit the mediation, uh, the carrier has to make a good faith effort for 21 days in order to try to get the claim solved. A lot of times they try to kick the bobo, they try to kick the ball down the street. Guess what I'm doing on day 15? Filing Judge complaint. Judy. Filing complaint. Advise the insured of their escalation options. And this is, uh, and this is uh, done on uh, between 45 and 60. Advise the insured of their escalation options, allowing them to make an informed decision, right? So, what, in y'all experience, after, let's say it gets to, because my day 60, I think is day 90 for some of y'all. At day 91, what do y'all typically are doing? What's going on? Y'all still calling the uh, insurance carrier? You, uh, you, you reaching out to your favorite insurance appraiser? You reaching out to your favorite attorney? What do you typically do? Okay. So this is my day 61. So if the carrier has paid at least $1 on the claim, even if it's below deductible, the policy has an appraisal clause, the claim facts are in the insurance favor, and I have access to a competent and experienced insurance appraiser, and it's one of those carriers that don't let me represent as appraiser, you know, whatever. I'm going appraisal route. Right, because guess what? One of the benefits of me submitting that CRN so early, uh, and once again, I'm no attorney, all right? But even when this appraisal closes and e everybody's happy, the insured can still get, uh, get an attorney and file for bad faith. A lot of people don't know that. On day 61, this is when I'm engaging an attorney. The carrier completely denies a legitimate claim. The carrier spent at least one dollar, but there's no appraisal clause. The perceivable facts are not in the insurer side, and I say perceivable because hopefully uh, y'all are like me. Y'all are not going to take a, a, a fraudulent claim, but sometimes the optics don't look good, right? So I'm, I'm thinking about all of that when I'm deciding how we're going to do this, right? Uh, let's see, and no more money available to pay for the appraisal, uh, the appraisal professional, and our experts. Uh, one of the benefits, which I don't know if one of these, ben these benefits might uh, be eroded after July 1st, but one of the benefits is if you retain a, an attorney, and this happens to be doing, typically the attorney takes care of all the expenses. So if you have a homeowner, insurer, someone who you know is low on cash, and you know that, oh man, this is an easy appraisal, or this is an easy, easy, but you need experts, but even your expense account is low, bite the bullet, bring on an attorney. All right, so this is the most important graph I ever made, right? So in an insurance fight, a PA is likely going to win. In a bar fight, an independent adjuster. Cat fight, I think PA's got it a little bit. And in a pillow fight, those desk adjusters, man, they kill it. <laughs> but the reason why I did it is because basically believe none of what you hear and half of what you see. And I would have put who quoted it, but it was at least like four people who were credited for quoting this, but it's a good quote, right? One thing that was hurting me early in my career was I was trying to close based off what people were telling me they were closing. It seemed good, high in the sky. And I even did it once. <laughs> like, like, that, that, like that just huge, immaculate number, right? But does it happen all the time? You gotta, you gotta operate on the percentages. And if you know how to do it right, if you know what the real numbers are, make it happen to where, and if you're able to get paid and get the homeowner paid, uh, preferably the first, the, them first in you, right? Then everything gonna work out. If, but if you try to shoot for the moon every time, every time, uh, uh, family please, have your kids avert their eyes from the shooting screens. Another public adjuster has just exploded, right? It won't work in the long run. 
and you're gonna lose customers and you're gonna start getting bad reviews. So all I say is, start actually paying attention to what you're selling, not what people are telling you to sell. Start asking people, you know how when people used to tell you they made, well, to come join this multi-level marketing, you say, let me see your bank account. Oh shoot, let, let me see your commission check. Start finding out what's really happening. And this, and I like to make my day, this is what I imagine the desk of justice are saying whenever they see my file, right? Because I'm not even talking to them at all. They just see it and they just pass it. Uh, did you get another first notice of loss for Randolph Love too? Yes, girl. I'm about to go get some lunch because they don't got to do nothing. They spread this out to the mediator because guess what? I don't have to build a relationship with them. And once again, it's nothing personal. I want to build a relationship with the mediator that counterpart who actually gets claim authority by Florida statute to settle, they have to have the right to settle my full estimate and they have to have the right, if we reach a, a settlement during mediation, to send that out within 10 days. Did y'all know that? A lot of people don't. You can request, if, you, if you're if you doing mediations now or you start going the mediation route and you reach a settlement, say hey, go ahead and send that out in 10 days. Watch what they say. Okay. My company is full of unique individuals. All of us are different. We have public adjuster, Randolph Love. We have insurance appraiser, Randolph Love. We have expert witness, Randolph Love. And we have blissfully ignorant. That's so innocent, Randolph Love. But if you need any help, just call me. I'm available. Uh, that's my QR code if you wanted to scan it up. Uh, I'm at RandolphLoveConsulting.com. Uh, I am an insurance appraiser, so if you are a, a public adjuster or in the remediation, mitigation, and you need an appraiser, holler at me. If you need a public adjuster, holler at me. If you need an expert witness, holler at me, because those things have to be done in a certain way in order for it to meet the standard, because you never know what, what uh, jurisdiction is gonna fall in. If it's falling in federal, you want to make sure that your report is written a certain way to where it holds weight and it don't get thrown out. But that's me in a nutshell. I appreciate y'all. Thank you. I'm right on the line. Oh, appreciate it. That was, uh, that was amazing. Randolph Love, Randolph Love, Randolph Love.